Hey everybody, Yehuda Sunshine here uh, with Yael Moaf and our guest today, John Klimshin. 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 I was Klimshin. 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 Wow, that's brilliant. I'm going to use that. <laughs> you should use that, John. I'm going to write that down. Immediamente. I know I'm Yehuda. And I can barely get that out of myself. But I'm glad to see that you know who you are because uh, it's tough sometimes. It's tough. It is. It is. We get outside of ourselves. Exactly. It's, it's a tough time. So thank you so much for joining us uh, for this casual conversation. Normally, we, we do a casual conversation on cybersecurity. But this time, we're really excited to do a casual conversation with John, really about communication and kind of picking his brain on how to better be able to, to talk and to be able to convey ideas to, to different audiences. So it's, it's an honor to, to have you. And uh, thank you so much for, for joining us. Well, it, it, I'm, I'm thrilled. I was very excited to see how many people were planning on joining us. I've gotten messages over the last week of folks that cannot fit it into their schedule and they, they wanted to make sure that we were recording this. So clearly we are uh, striking a chord in, in addressing this particular topic and I'm excited for the conversation. Been looking forward to it all week. Awesome. Um, so maybe maybe we'll jump into it. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about your background and, and some of the, the things that have influenced your understanding in effective communication. Well, I think that it probably started when I had indicated a, a, a gift for language pretty early in life. I was in sixth grade on Long Island, and I was part of a very small group of students that were selected to begin uh, studying a second language in seventh grade. In, in the school system that I grew up in on Long Island, the uh, moving into junior high school, which was seventh, eighth and ninth grade, most students were not offered a second language until eighth grade. As I said, a small group was offered it in seventh and I started studying Russian. I chose Russian for a variety of reasons. Uh, this was many years ago. So yeah. And I thought I was the spy. You, you might actually be the spy. Я не знаю, я турист. <laughs> That's what they so, all say. Those that don't speak Russian, what I just said was, I don't know, I'm a tourist, which is, of course, the, the typical spy response, right, Yehuda? Mm -hmm. That's right. Of course. Yes. Of course. But we wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know such things. No, 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 no. Uh, it's funny because one of my <laughs> clients, when I told him about this event, he said, and that's the day I found out that John was a spy. Um, so in studying Russian, uh, I learned something very, very early on. And when we say that we learn things, okay, was my awareness at that age, the kind of awareness that I have now? Of course not. However, some seeds were planted and paths were begun way back then because my first teacher of Russian was born and raised outside of Moscow, escaped from the Soviet Union, made her way to Long Island, and she found a job teaching the Russian language. She was my teacher for two years, and we learned, to me, much more important things than how to say the words. We learned why the words were structured that way, why the sentences were built that way, why the verbs were conjugated that way, because the Russian culture dictated it. See, I, I learned this when I pursued my passion for languages by studying Italian, French, German, Spanish, and of course, I'm still struggling with English. But when I learned, when I, when I pursued those interests, I, I guess I discovered in my early 20s that you cannot learn basic conversational in another language, a second, third, fifth, whatever language. You cannot learn basic conversational in any language without learning something about the culture. And if we can learn about the culture, then we can find what we have in common. And, and as, a, as a professional speaker and as an executive coach, as an author, all of these titles that have been bestowed upon me because I've pursued this path of curiosity, what I've learned is that the it, it, it just it brings me back to what Mr. Mandela said, that when you speak to a person in a language that you that that person understands, you speak to his head. When you speak to a person in a language that that person speaks, you speak to their heart. Mm -hmm. And 
I, I have a background as a musician. I, w I uh, indicated some some leanings in that way, in that direction, right around the same uh, age as, as I was offered language. And I found these commonalities and these important connections. And, and as far as I'm concerned, the most Im important intersection of knowledge in my life is the, the fact that language at its core is music. And everybody responds to music. What's that? That was deep. That was deep. Okay. She's on mute, but she's trying to communicate. Yeah, you're on mute, but she, she's trying to communicate. Yeah, I know, right? It's tough. We're doing that. I, I'm like, I, that, you know, at that funeral. That... <laughs> it's like so what, was, what was this supposed to be? What were you saying? No, I was saying, sorry, I, I did that classic doofus <laughs> thing. But um, I was saying, I always say that the other way around to people. I say that, you know, music is language, you know. And so when I'm explaining like why I love music, I explain like, you know, it, but it's the same concept. So I just, I find it really fascinating that, you, you know, you learned, you know, you kind of had the same insight through studying music and language. So. And, and, and I'm, I'm glad that it resonated with you because here's the thing. We want what we have to say and Yehuda, we've talked about this for a year, yeah. what and how we write. Most important thing is we want it to resonate. So we're going to talk about that in a couple of minutes, but because um, I know you have some some questions along those lines. So just very quickly, do do you play, Yael? Do you play an instrument? <laughs> I play. <laughs> Sometimes I. This play is the, the understatement of a lifetime. She's been waiting for this question. <laughs> no, I play. I play most of the wind instruments. I'm learning violin right now and piano. I know and I know piano, and I'm learning violin right now and banjo. Okay. See, that is a great <laughs> musician response. I play these and I kind of know that, but I'm not really good at that. And, I, you know, we, we talk about what we do. And then, of course, we spend a couple of minutes making excuses or apologies. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is that the, clearly I can see it in your eyes that you have such an admiration and a care and a love for what music is all about, that mm -hmm. it speaks to you very deeply. And when I have the opportunity and the privilege to perform, I, my prayer for 30 minutes before I take the stage or, or go sit in the chair at the corner of the winery, wherever I'm performing, my prayer is let the gift come through me. Mm -hmm. let, let it. I don't want this to be about me. I want this to be about what uh, a, a former collaborator of mine taught me. He said, music is the invisible art form. Mm -hmm. And the great thing about music is that, again, you either like it or you don't, but if you do like it, then you pursue it and you learn more about it and you want to repeat it. I mean, I have uh, multiple tabs open all day with YouTube videos of musicians and composers and, and artists and, and, and performers that just speak to me over and over and over again because we want that connection and we want that that resonant response. Mm -hmm. And I know, Yale, I know you know the, uh, hopefully I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Yeah. Yeah, okay. uh, I, I know you know the answer to this, but we'll 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 put Yehuda on the spot. What was the first musical instrument? I actually first. don't, and I don't know if you would count the drum because I figure people beat around on things. If I had to, not count. the drum. Would you say Yehuda? It, it's if it's not the drum, hmm. Maybe like a like a didgeridoo or something. The kazoo. The, the, th the throat. The, the human singing. Voice. The vocal. Singing. Yeah, that was voice is the first <laughs> musical instrument. Trick because question. <laughs> well, it's a trick question, of course. No, but it's true. <laughs> the beauty of great Most questions <laughs> is that it gets the listener thinking. And when I get the listener thinking, they are drawn in. And when mm -hmm. they're drawn in, the conversation no longer is about me. Right. Now mm -hmm. we've got an opportunity to really connect because in today's world, in the world five years ago, in the world 500 years ago, one of the greatest, deepest, most dramatic human needs is to connect with other people. And mm -hmm. music allows us to do that. I, I connect with the original performer when I look to, to, to learn a new piece of music. I connect with the memory I have of the first mm -hmm. time I heard that piece of music. And I want to either, I want to honor it by kind of reworking it, or I endeavor deeply to recreate it. Right. So there's, I mean, all this stuff going on. And so the, again, that, that learning a language and learning music, I had no idea were parallel paths 
until a client of mine some years ago who was an attorney, she said, this is clearly your path of inquiry. And I had never heard that phrase before. And I said, what do you mean by that? She says, this is your, this is your guiding passion. You will never tire of learning more about language. You will never tire of learning more about music. And it was one of those moments, right, where it's almost like someone takes a cup of ice water and throws it in your face and says, hey, dummy, this is who you are. <laughs> <laughs> that's, wow. that's fascinating it's fascinating to hear your your realization of it and how you're integrating it because like I've, I've spoken to you many times and you feel like the it's a flow but at the same point it's this complete and total awareness and, and when you're talking about music and when you're talking about language and you're talking about culture you know the the points that are really connecting with me it's how do you connect with somebody on their terms in how they can appreciate it and how it can have a lot of different interpretations, but how you view it is kind of inconsequential. It's really trying to think on how are you going outside? Just because I understand the language doesn't mean my broken sentence is going to be received. And, and I think that that's something that's very interesting when, I, when I'm hearing you talk about that. And how can you articulate that? And how can you understand where it's not that you are the audience or you're trying to appreciate it, but thinking about the other and trying to absorb their culture and their understanding in a way to be able to communicate or connect with them better? Well, there, there are a variety of words that you use there that, that speak to me. Absorb, right? We don't, we don't, we don't uh, crash into a culture. We absorb the culture. Anyone who has had the privilege in this life to visit a country other than the one that they grew up in has, has had their eyes opened. For the better or for the worse is immaterial. One of the key things when we were raising our children, who both of my children are now grown functioning humans that I no longer have to feed, you, you want to just show off, John? <laughs> you just show off all day about how yours will feed themselves independently and then they go to sleep at whatever time doesn't care about you. It doesn't matter. Okay. Okay. <laughs> They're, Sounds in 30s, good. Yo. They're gone. We can, we can yes. mute you. We can mute you if this continues. <laughs> <laughs> now nah, he put in his time. He uh, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> Well, early in my practice, I was very fortunate that we had enjoyed some success. And uh, I'll talk about my practice a little bit later. And I, I had been traveling extensively and gathered a whole bunch of bonus miles on a particular airline because I learned early, you know, bank them, bank them, bank them. And my wife and I sat down on a Saturday morning and said, hey, let's let's go to Europe next summer. Let's let's plan it now. We'll leave a couple of days after the end of the school year. Let's go. And at that time, I had had a lot of exposure to different languages and had studied them and and that sort of thing. And I sat my, both of my kids down and I said, listen, we are going to be going to France and Germany. You will learn how to say yes, no, please, thank you. <laughs> how much is this? And where's the loo? The <laughs> right. <laughs> You will learn how to say both in French and in German with good pronunciation or you're not getting on the plane with us because we are going to be visitors, guests in these people's country. We're going to show them respect. And I will tell you, no matter what stories you hear about how Americans are received either in France or in Germany, there are no barriers when people hear the music of their own language. I, I, I lived in Germany. I lived in Germany. Deutsch? <laughs> yeah. And when they heard my accent, they would say, Oh, bist du Turkish? <laughs> yeah, no, they weren't that nice. <laughs> so, so, so kind of them. So kind of them. But that's that's another point where first of all, when did well, I become due to you? Okay. <laughs> but, that, but, that, but that's a touch point that I think is really interesting. They're trying to interpret you and they have their own cultural biases and you're trying to get something over. How can you be able to push that aside or say that, you know, it could be something that's superficial, but try and either approach them more on their terms or on the other end, being able to accept your limitations and how am I going to be able to get this over, even if they're being petty? And, and I think that that's something that's different. Right? I, I'm trying. I'm trying to be nice. Not that you, not that that would ever have happened. No, no, no. Well, I was and, like, yeah, no. <laughs> well, and, and and learning how to say excuse me, or mm -hmm. I wonder if you can help me. Incredibly useful, right? In Shuldigan Z. Well, not in Hebrew. Not in Hebrew. Um, 
I, you'd be I, amazed. Since you'd I be joke amazed. That I don't understand. <laughs> oh, it, so in Hebrew, the only people that have ever said "excuse me" are foreigners. So, like the Israelis will look over at that. They understand zoos. They understand move. But when you say like "slicha," excuse me, they, there's this kind of pause where they're they're wondering, are you talking to them? Or is this just like a philosophical thing that you're floating out there? Because it can't possibly, it can't it possibly be to me. Where you live, but again, that goes back to culture. It depends depends where you are in Israel. Mm-hmm. Exactly and, right. Uh, what what is the local? What's the what's the local feel? What's the what's I live the, in a town that's very elbows and zoos, right? But you go to another town, it's not. It's just a different culture. It's, yeah, I live in the 1600s. Yael lives in a busier society. We were talking about how I live. I live kind of in like medieval Europe almost in, in how my community works. It's it's like a different time in a different place. And it's kind of funny because the, the norms and how people interact, there's just this innocence and the this sincerity that isn't in other places. And when you see people like that, you, you connect to them differently. You communicate with them differently. And the cultural norms and how I'm going to have my kids on the street is completely and totally different because your, your approach is there. I like how you now have us over analyzing. See, that's the power. You you just you just started this conversation, and now we've my mind is going so many ways on this theory. <laughs> and I have other now questions. We go, we These are supposed to be other like questions. <laughs> well, but here's the thing: the fact that you feel that you can go on for hours with us, with me now, means that I've created a connection. I mean, we are on opposite sides of the world. Mm-hmm. Thank thank God. We have the technology to be able to have this live conversation like this and record it and to be able to go back to it. I know. Uh, so I didn't grow up like this. <laughs> 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 <We're honest. laughs> so. All right. So you, who do you said you had other questions? I have, I have other questions. So it, we, we talked a little bit about these early experiences, how you, you know, in seventh grade that you had this language class and that, but I assume that that something happened to you after seventh grade. I don't want to. I don't want to burst the bubble. But I assume that you continue to to achieve and to go somewhere else. So I, I looked into your bio because you know you're here, and I, I was wondering: do you, do you think that your military experience, your academic experience, what are what's something that that really shaped your worldview in something that practically I need to adjust my thinking, my approach? Where it's not I'm going to change the the subtlety in my language. I really need to to put this into action. So how, how are those experiences or something else really framed you? Well, I, I think it is academic as someone who is at my age and has never graduated from college. I, I have I have physical proof of completing two courses. Uh, I have them filed away. I, I was not a college <laughs> person. Um, I joined the military uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, I had just uh, left a band that was touring the tri-state area, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut. We were semi-professional. And when I say semi-professional, I mean that every so often we made 2 or $3 more than what it cost us to go pay, play the gig. That's, <laughs> if you that's didn't so, drink. That is a if we level didn't of drink, success, actually. <laughs> that's exactly. And, and you know, a, a lot of times we actually could pay our own bill at White Castle without reaching into our own funds. So, you know, just those of you that know what White Castle is. Mm-hmm. So... Um, right around the time that that phase of life ended, there were commercials on television for something called designer jeans. And there was a particular designer jean that had these young women standing in front of fountains in these foreign places. And they would, in whatever local accent, say, my home is at home, but I live in Britannia. And I just basically, you know, kind of wiped the drool <laughs> off and said, I have to go find her. (laughs) And since I didn't really have any marketable skills and I wanted to see the world, I I really made a distinct and dramatic shift at 19 years old. I had been living on my own for two and a half years, had been a semi-professional musician for two of those years. I said, you know what? The only way I'm getting to Europe is if I join the military. And I walked down the street at lunchtime from my job, my day job. And I walked in and I said to the recruiter, I want to join. And if you don't get me out of here in two weeks, I'm going to go join the Air Force. Ooh, Ooh <laughs> those, those are fighting words. Those are actually. Yeah. <laughs> get their quota. That's it. I took something called the ASVAB, the Armed Services Vocational mm-hmm. Aptitude Battery. Mm-hmm. He went in the back and graded it, came out, and he says, um, what job would you like? 
Because <laughs> <laughs> apparently the fact that I could complete a sentence by writing it out and answer questions clearly, I, you know, I kind of did well on the test. So they offered me a bunch of things. And I said, look, the only thing I want to do is go to Europe. The only thing I want to do is go to Europe. Well, you know, if you go to this school, we'll send you here. If we go to this school, you go, send me here. I said, you know what? I, I want to have fun. So I want to go to cooking school. They wanted me to do nuclear, uh, you know, they wanted me to be on a nuclear sub. And I was like, mm, that sounds too difficult. I just want to go. <laughs> so, of course, when you join the military and you say you want to go to Europe, where do they send you? They send you to San Diego, California. Mm -hmm. You say you want to be stationed in Jacksonville, Florida. They send you to San Diego, California. And I went and I did what is called the West Pacific Cruise. Couldn't be further away from Europe, right? The Philippines, Korea, Singapore. But after enduring that, and it was a wonderful time, after enduring that for 14 months, I got a change of duty. And I was attached to something called the CBs, the Construction Battalion. Mm -hmm. And the first place we went was Rota, Spain. Oh, my uncle was there. Been there. <laughs> How, what years? Maybe we walked by each other. Uh, that was in the like, early 2000s, late 90s. So uh, I, was, I was there 20 years before him. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's actually already when he was already like 40 when he got put there. Okay. So, yeah. It's a nice place, though. Rota, Spain, it? right near Cadiz, the oldest city in mm -hmm. Spain, right near the Costa. We were on the Costa del Sol. And my background in language, when we arrived, we were given uh, employees that were Spanish nationals. And I thought, I'm going to be in Spain for six months, which is one of the great things about the CBs. You don't just go there for two days and leave. We were there for six months. And I, I remember saying to uh, Juan and Jose, when they came to work, I said, por favor, solamente habla para mí en español. And they looked at each other like, the heck is he trying to say? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I just stood there. I said, solamente español. So they said in English, you want us to speak Spanish to you? Yes, yes. That's what I'm trying to say. So for four months, every day, they were talking to me about something different. They were showing me different things. They were pictures and conversations and stories about the weekend. And the next thing you know, my buddies are like, Clemson, you speak Spanish. Let's go to another city and go drinking. Let's go to another city and pick up girls. Success, success. <laughs> and here's the thing. I was so conditioned and so accustomed to it that when we went and visited Cadiz for the first time, I didn't speak a word of English the entire day we were there. It was all in Spanish. People, I, we were at the bus station. A woman walked up to me and said, can you help me? And she asked me in Spanish. And I said, I, I will try. And she was shocked that I was an American. Because apparently I'd had a tan and I looked like I belonged there. <laughs> the the path of inquiry, Yehuda, Yael, it was it was defined because I was like, I'm in this country. I want to enjoy it. I want to absorb it. I want to embrace it. And next thing you know, I'm out jamming with musicians out in town. Next thing you know, I'm I'm performing with with a band on the bass, and some of them were Spanish nationals, and that connection mm -hmm. made me feel so at home right. that I thought, where else in the world can I do this? Now, let me ask you though, something that a lot of people encounter when they're, when they're in the same situation, they're not able to power through like you did, especially, you know, if you're a person who's used to being able to communicate very effectively with nuance, with everything, how do you overcome that initial frustration when you're, when you're not understanding and or make being able to express yourself in the way that you would like to. What makes a musician practice effective? <laughs> we listen. The air. Mm -hmm. We listen. I love to listen. I have worn needles out on record players. I have done everything I can to wear out iPod uh, digital files. I love to listen. And I would, I, I would say, please correct me. Please make sure. It's the pronunciation. I remember my, my Russian teacher. She said, your pronunciation, it sounds like you grew up in Moscow. That's a high compliment. That's that pretty good. ear. 
right? Mm -hmm. What's the what's the nuance? What's the what's the subtle change? How is that vowel pronounced when it's it's uh, predicated with that set of consonants? Is it shui or is it shui? Mm -hmm. I mean, wow! Some people don't even hear the difference. Spin the pull the recording back, rewind the recording, and listen to that difference again, because they there there's a big difference between B and B flat. <laughs> Right. Yeah. The two don't go together very well. <laughs> no, they really don't. <laughs> they really don't. <laughs> I try to avoid B flat because it just confuses me. B minor is one thing. B flat, not so much. <laughs> Have you ever, this is just me being totally random, but because you're talking music and we're talking language, have you ever studied Turkish? I have not. The closest I just recommend I've that's come, your next one. <laughs> is it my next one? So you'll, it's, you'll it's actually me musical. It really literally is a musical language. <laughs> How open would you be to sending me some instructional videos so I can we can make fun of each other in Turkish next time we talk? I think that'd be fun. <laughs> Would love to hear it. All right, sorry to interrupt. So I just wanted to make that suggestion to you for your next adventure. <laughs> and everybody else should learn Turkish too. While that while we're talking about it, I mean, it should just everyone gets be... his way. <laughs> well, <laughs> exactly. Well, if we want to be able to communicate with everybody, it seems like that's the only way it's going to happen. So it's settled. It's settled. <laughs> So it, we, we've talked about, you know, the, the comparisons of music and, and culture. What are, what are some things that people kind of misassociate or confuse about communication? Where they say that this is something I'm always doing right, but actually you're completely and totally missing the point. Because I think well, that that's something our audience mm -hmm. would love to hear. The American playwright George Bernard Shaw said the biggest problem in communication is the assumption that it has occurred. <laughs> I can yep. talk all day. That doesn't mean we're communicating. Mm -hmm. To me, communication, my definition, it's not Oxford English Dictionary, it's Clinton's Dictionary. And the definition of communication is the positive progressive exchange of ideas. Mm -hmm. Think about that. It's not about the words. It's not even about the point. It's the idea, which is ethereal, right? Or is it ethereal or ephemeral? Could be both. Uh, it could be both. I mean, ephemeral is that it's fleeting. That's, yeah, that's a tough mm -hmm. one. That's right. <laughs> but it is, here. What, here's the thing. When you and I operate in the theater of ideas, all of a sudden our the synapses start firing, right? Our, our eyes start to brighten. And we know, you know that from having young children that you do. I know that from having children the age that I do, that when we talk about ideas, it, oh, well, what about, the, and I haven't thought about it that way. And oh, blah, blah, blah. we work out our ideas. We work out our feelings. We work out our opinions, our judgments, our, where we want to go by talking about them. So when we want to communicate with others, think about that. We don't communicate to people. We communicate with them. We may write for them, but we don't write with them. It's a very difficult thing to write with someone. And the thing about writing an article, writing an email, writing a LinkedIn post, writing whatever, is that the, to me, the most important billboard in the back of our mind has to be filled with the question, what do I want the language I'm about to deliver to accomplish? Because very often... We want the language to accomplish, this makes me feel better because I got it out of my system. I'm not sure that's going to really advance things. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure that everybody understands how smart I am. That's the worst reason to write anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> my friend, the, the, the screenwriter, Michael Albanese, he says, don't write because you want to say something. Write because you have something to say. Mm -hmm. So how do we say something to people that we may never meet, may never be in conversation with? How do we write in a way that draws them in, that mm -hmm. accomplishes the great role of all writing? Uh, I've, uh, I've had books published. I've had books that I've completed that I have not published. I've created and delivered, narrated and recorded four audiobooks. What is it that we want to accomplish? Well, to me, number one, I want people to be inspired to continue. 
Number two, I want them to take what they see, hear, learn, and go put it into practice. And the great word about practice, the great thing about the word practice, musicians, we know this, mm -hmm. is that the first 15 minutes of practice is reminding ourselves that we know what the hell we're doing. <laughs> yep, the warm up. <laughs> That's right. I actually can move from B minor to D without <laughs> scratching, without going flat, without, you know. So I think that's really good message. Every, you know, everything you just said, because I think of, you know, we deal in um, with a lot of content that's on, you know, I just went on rant about that, but blogs that are on people's websites and, you know, they're writing them ideally, you know, for, you know, their target audience, et cetera, all the marketing blah. And so many of them, I feel that they, it's like they wrote it to themselves or, or again, like you said, it's that risk that they're they're trying to they're trying so hard to prove that they're smart that it just the re, it, the resonation isn't there, you know, it doesn't resonate at all. So I think that's a really valuable point for you know I'm gonna you know go back later listen to this and take out some of these quotes and pass it on to these content writers <laughs> because I think you you make such an important point about you know to just keep you know and then warm up keep that in mind and then write and see if you mm. can say the same get the same concept out, but actually communicate it and not just flat paper, you know? And what that does is it points us to the, the importance of editing, right? Mm -hmm. I sent a very important email yesterday. I wrote it in seven minutes. I edited it for 30. I, I can relate to that. <laughs> No, uh, that's 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 self-serving. No, that's not really about the topic. No, that's referring to something that you know. No, no. no. What do I want this writing to accomplish? Mm -hmm. Inspire, create clarity, in, move someone to action, have them view the platform as a regular resource for useful information. Well, when you say that, I'm distracted by that statement. When you deliver it. I'm not. There's a there's an old rule in writing fiction, which I have attempted many times. Two of the books that I've written are fiction. And there's a there's a big difference between showing what's going on in the novel and telling. Right? Mm -hmm. There was a dog. It was a brown dog. The brown dog was down the street. The brown dog down the street was barking. <gasps> oh my gosh. How about the brown dog that's always running down my street was barking today. Mm -hmm. Very big difference. Show, don't tell. So mm -hmm. show what the point of your article is or your piece or your book or your novel, whatever. And to keep in mind that writing is not done for the writer. It's done in service of the reader. Yeah. That, that not, quote. not that I'm passionate yeah. about this stuff or anything. Yeah. The, no, it's, that's it's the quote. That's the quote that when I when I like I've I've been talking to John for like a little bit more than a year now, and, and the thing that that really pushed me over the edge that made me like a fan was trying to get into that mindset where you know why am I trying to do this? What am I trying to accomplish? And am I doing it? Am I passionate about this idea? But I'm missing how it's being taken in because I'm so caught up that I need to be smart or I need to get this idea across to my stakeholders, but not to these people I'm trying to pitch it to because I'm just missing it. And I, you know, I think that it's fascinating to approach it in a way where you can be more, oh, we see more Moabs have entered the picture. Very nice. We'll see who's communicating now. Oh, snap. Uh, but I, I just think that's very interesting what we can do to be able to be more passionate in conveying the information and more understanding that our role in it is not as the gatekeeper, it's a facilitator. You know, it's something that's that I don't need to be taking control of this. I'm trying to be the person that's making it happen. And I, I want to know maybe what your insights are where, where somebody can say, just because I'm passionate about writing or I'm passionate about this idea doesn't mean I can't rip this apart to make sure that I'm conveying it to my audience and that at any point it's about them. It's never about me. It's about them. Absolutely. Look, one of my favorite novelists is an American named John Irving. He wrote The World According to Garth, The Hotel New Hampshire, um, uh, 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 a couple of others. And World According to Garth, wow. That's, wrote, a, that's a flashback. 
Yeah. That's that's reaching back there. And I have, right? <laughs> I have a, okay. Here, here's how much you're, you're the Robin Williams? You're the Robin Williams poster? No, I have cool. yeah, the, I just to give you some insight into the relationship I have with my now 37 and a half year married wife. This was mm -hmm. the first gift I ever gave her, and oh boy, was she disappointed. <laughs> oh snap. But that's that's the thing. I guess you're still learning. She understands communication is not it's not a singular thing that's a fluid thing and we're always building on it and we're always working on it. How's it's, your communication going now, Yael? <laughs> I'm letting him get his feelings in. There we go. So I was telling the story of the fact that uh, the first gift I gave to, uh, at the time, my girlfriend, who later became my fiance, who has now been my wife for most of my adult life, the first gift I ever gave her she, I brought her a, a wrapped box and she was very excited until she opened it and saw that it was a book. <laughs> she was, oh man, her whole face changed. A book? Right. <laughs> now we know. Is it a good book? That's a good book. That copy's been with us for years. So John Irving, the author of that book, I've, I've read interviews with him and everything, and he he has a great saying. He says, writing is rewriting. He said, I, I will spend a lot more time editing and going back and reshaping and making sure that every sentence serves the paragraph, every paragraph serves the chapter, and the entire chapter is this self-contained experience. Mm -hmm. If we're going to write something shorter than a book, and there's there's no there's no looking down my nose at that. I've written over a thousand articles myself to 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 deliver any piece that achieves clarity, mm -hmm. that maintains the voice throughout, and inspires the reader to get all the way to the end. That's good writing. Yep. So Did bullet points. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> oh no no. I, oh, before before we before we go to John's favorite author, which I'm sure is going to be awesome, I want I want to pick your brain a little bit about some things that that writers kind of sneak in to try and grab your attention. When I when I think of you know I'm going to have a really catchy you know. Um, like subheading, I'm going to to have some bullet points where I try and extract the the main ideas. Do you think that that that's something where if done right, it can guide the narrative, or do you think that that it's really just helping people skim? Because I'm always trying to get people to to read the whole thing, and then at the same point, I understand there's limiting returns. Do I want to be able to get these three or four points over, and somebody will be able to move on to the next, or do I actually expect they'll get through? the white paper, the research, whatever, whatever the time is that I'm putting into it to be able to get something out of it. So, all right. So what's the question? Is it, do I believe in subtitles? Do you believe in subtitles, bullet points, catchy things to grab people's attention? Or do you think that the, the content is king and you don't need to have something that, that pops out in that? It's the, it's the narrative. It's the structure of the well, writing itself. It's not an either or. Here's the thing. Content is absolutely king. I mean, I, I, re, I remember specific sentences from that book. And I read that book when I was 26 years old. That is an eternity ago. I remember specific sentences. Why? Because but you're only 28. You're only 28. Come on. Uh, Two years isn't so long. Plus. That's very kind of you. <laughs> Content is king. And here's the thing. I love, I love three bullet points, a maximum of five bullet points, not two, because the mind will not retain things in groups of two or four. It will retain, it will recall, it will correlate, it will collate. It'll be able to uh, assemble and, and to assimilate ideas, mm -hmm. concepts, points in groups of three or five or even seven more readily than in even numbered groups. We don't know why, we just know that that is the case. I, I mean, these are the kind of things I talk about on my patio on the weekends with my friends, the neuroscientists. This is what we talk about. So this is why not too many people show up in my house on the weekends, but that's another story. <laughs> so when we, number one, when we come up with a subtitle, it's gotta be serving the title and or make the reader more curious. Here's the thing. I wrote a book on sales. I have the unique distinction of having that book published on the absolute worst possible publishing date in the history of book publishing. September 11th? No, 
Even worse, <laughs> February 28th, 2008. Ooh, that's bad. It yeah, was the beginning of the global bad. financial crisis. <laughs> he had paid to place the books in, in, in uh, uh, airports all across North America. I had done a, a, a big promotion. We were getting media. No one, it, the, the world yawned. However, the book has had legs. It still sells today. The title of the book is How to Sell Without Being a Jerk. The subtitle is A Foolproof Approach to the World's Second Oldest Profession. A little risque. That's very you know, nice. Juicy. <laughs> but it goes to exactly what you're saying. It's, it's enough to get you excited, but it's not so much a flash in the pan where, you know, it's only going to be this buzzwords. You have to do something else. You have to be able to bring a little bit more value to it. But then at the same point, it's still exciting. It's still, it brings you in. Hmm. What do you want? What do you want your, your writing to accomplish? Number one, to retain the reader. Mm -hmm. Number two, to get them thinking. Too often, we want to add seven words after that to get them thinking about this so that they can. And that, 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 that. if I can get you thinking in the first two paragraphs, you will continue to read. I, you, who do you, I, I'm sure you can imagine when people say to me, Oh, I skimmed your book. <laughs> thank you so much. Seven months of my life and you skimmed it. I can't thank you enough. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I don't have any hair left. I pulled it out for the graphic designer, and you just turned to the third picture. Thank you so much. My mom got to the fifth. Come on. <laughs> and, and she could ask intelligent questions about it. But my, stepfather, my stepfather gave me edits. I was like, I just wanted to tell you I was proud of this. He's like, well, we're, we're not finished yet. We're not done. <laughs> <laughs> oh, That's true you. love. That's that, true that love. That is yeah. true love. You're right. You're right. <laughs> Uh, all right. So ask me another question. Otherwise, I will just keep speaking ad infinitum, which is uh, Latin for continually. <laughs> um, uh, awesome. So, Yell, do you want to you take the next question? I am going to excuse myself now, and I am very, very sorry. I have to do this. I am really enjoying this, but um, I'm going to have to go take care of a family matter. All oh. right. <laughs> So I hope I'll, to pick this you, up again sometime soon, John. Thank you very much. Please send me some, some Turkish videos so I can we can do a Zoom and, and communicate. That sounds super fun. All right. Have this a good is, night, This will be great, y'all. See you soon. So glad to get rid of her. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. That's my partner in crime. I really, I hope, I wish that, that she gets the kids to sleep. I gave up when my, my eldest decided to sleep by the door. I was like, you know what? Whatever works, as long as you're sleeping there, I'm down. Um, so, so I want to go into to something practical. We, we were talking about about tech leaders and cybersecurity professionals. What, sure. What's something that that they the the pitfall that they would often fall into in, in in trying to convey technical concepts? Because this is something that I've spoken to you about, where you know you could have a product that's very complex, this technology that that achieves all these very very involved integrated ideas. How do we strip that down? To, to convey it to our audience that this is the actual value. Because on our on our end, you know, we're very much in this echo chamber where we hear these words, we hear the, the tech, we hear this innovation. How do we understand that outside people don't care about that? They want to hear, where does it get me? How is that something that in my terminology, in a language that normal people understand that I could really get this? How do we strip that away? Well, I, I learned something in one of my leadership roles. I reported to someone who was the VP of marketing at the time. And uh, shout out to him if he sees this or hears this. Name is Rich Severa. And Rich, every time he wanted to make a point with me in a one-on-one -on -one conversation, he would lean on some very reliable devices. One was the use of analogies. He was brilliant with his use of analogies. And the great thing about analogies is that you do not have to necessarily be someone for whom the, the, the tools in the analogy specifically resonate. It's the story that the analogy tells that speaks to you. I was speaking with a client who's a CEO and he really, 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 really wanted something to happen. And I said, here's the thing. The boat will not go any faster just because you're leaning over the bow. 
And that spoke to him. He, he can want it all he wants. He can lean into it all he wants. It's going to find its way to the surface. It's going to work itself out. When we use an analogy, what we do is we create some imagery and we may even be able to draw on metaphor. So I think that taking very difficult concepts and making them clear and compelling for the reader, we can do that by using analogies. Here's the thing about this cybersecurity prevention tool. It would be like you coming home and having this and this happen and you decided to do this to fix it. Oh, I get it now, right? So mm -hmm. when you're promoting your product or you're explaining a product or a platform, work to be able to share the idea with me as though you're speaking to a 10 year old. People say a five year old, you can't keep a five year old's attention long enough to explain something like this to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, let's, let's try and be reasonable here. He's a very sharp 10 year old, but a 10 year old nonetheless. A five, That's like, exactly I, right. I just try and think about it. It's like shiny lights, shiny lights, candy, shiny lights, candy. <laughs> Loud noise. <laughs> Yes. Oh my gosh. Yes. So uh, <laughs> I, I think that the use of, of analogy, I mean, in my writing, I, I remember using the, uh, I drew on a story from my childhood because I wanted people in, in a leadership concept. I wanted them to understand that it's not always about pressing on the accelerator. It's not always about driving in and leaning in as hard as you can. So I use this analogy from when I learned to operate a powerboat on the Long Island Sound when I was a teenager in that it's, it's, it's accelerate coast accelerate coast. You don't want to be jerking forward or back. You don't want to have the wake of the boat come up behind you and force the boat forward. You don't always have to have the throttle all the way up. And mm -hmm. that analogy has created a lot of conversations. And how powerful would it be for the next piece that you or anyone watching this writes, that that piece creates conversations? Exactly. Exactly. Like that, that's what I'm really trying to go with because I, you know, as somebody who's been on the vendor side, who's, you know, done internal and external marketing and PR and all these, these different roles, it, it's very difficult to get this, this content where it's interesting, where it's exciting, where you're not so bogged down with these technical details, this, this minutia that you really miss why anybody would care, why anybody would really be drawn to your, your materials, your, you know, your stream and your flow and progression. Because I'm also always thinking, you know, it's not just this one article, it's not just this one opinion piece or this one comment. Everything is in a trajectory and everything builds upon it. So I need to be clear in each individual role if I'm building up into something, if I'm trying to highlight a different point, that I need to be effective in that communication and I need to be able to strip away, you know, the second comma, that that point where I don't give my, my reader either enough respect or I think that I need to do this over explaining. It's trying to find that sweet spot where what are they looking for? Not what am I trying to shove into the into the box, into the clown car. You know, when you open up a Rolls Royce, you never see 70 people come out. It's the right amount of proper guy who takes his time. And then, you know, you're you're approaching the situation with some class and some decorum and some foresight. So I'm, I'm always interested in hearing how we can break down some of those barriers. And on the, on the other end, what are some, some tools that we can always look at and say, you know, just because I have a difficult concept doesn't mean that I need to hit this brick wall. I can use something from my childhood. I could use something that's universal. I could use something that's regional or crosses all sorts of different disciplines to be able to pull at somebody's heartstrings and be able to get that idea across. Hmm. It's like that that joke uh, the, the someone comes up to a farmer and is admiring the the health of the farm and the the person says wow god gave you a great gift when he gave you this farm he said and then the farmer says yeah but you should have seen the condition he gave it to me <laughs> <laughs> It's a process there's no, there's, we are not living in, a, in a, an immediate call and response world, no matter what social media tries to tell us. And when we're communicating or writing for executives, what we want to achieve is we, we want to make sure that the, the writing 
is number one, it's in our voice, not in some academic or scholarly or superior voice. It, it is as close to conversational as we can achieve. And here's, here's something I learned from the editor of my first book. She said, I want you to, when you feel that you're done editing, I want you to walk around and read your writing out loud. Hear what it sounds like. Hear what kind of rhythm you're creating. There we go back to the connection mm -hmm. between language and music. And she said, if in any sentence you have to inhale once during the sentence, it's too long. If you have to inhale twice, you've just written a paragraph. That's not a sentence. You you pull out you pull out Hemingway, you know, he he has his baggage, but the sentence structure and how illustrative he is in this concise clear prose and you you close your eyes and you get it and he's not he's not writing or painting this picture that's for him it's for me and i can see every single minute detail without him having seven adjectives in a row and because it's not necessary understanding where you can you can make this in you know the difference between making a dish with 25 ingredients and seven ingredients this 25 ingredient dish could be delicious but the simplicity and the and the beauty in being able to achieve something with that that minimal amount, it could be just as as satisfying and achieve even more than than shoving all those words in the in the box. Agreed. So, uh, if we're satisfied with that one, uh, I really I liked your analogy too. I thought it was pretty good. Uh, I want to I want to thank you so much for your time. Um, I really, really learned a lot, and I think that our audience really took a lot out of this. And I think that it's, it's, you know, it's a great skill to be able to understand how important communication is and why we need to to value it and think about it more deeply. So I want to know where can people find out more about you, find out about your work, find out more about your your writing, and be able to to see some of your speaking and stuff across the internet. Sure, and thank you for that opportunity. Uh, four audiobooks, they, they may appear not to be related. They are deeply related. They start with what it means to sell, which we all do. Second, it, the second book is about leading sales teams. And I have had IT managers and chief information officers hire me to come in and bring that content to their teams without talking about selling because leading teams, inspiring them, drawing great things out of them, these concepts are portable. And then there, are, there is a book that I is a co-authorship exercise of mine with an inventor named Isaac Naor, and it's called Stream, Hack Your Consciousness. And then the most recent one is called Deeper Dialogue, Conversations That Inspire. All four of those audiobooks are available on audible.com as well as iTunes. And my last name is my website, uh, klimshin.com. Couldn't make it any clearer. Um, I'm also I'm happy to have people follow me on LinkedIn, reach out to connect with me on LinkedIn. And my work is about the intersection between language and music and I've yet to come across a, an industry or a profession where some piece of this has not been useful. So it's been a great journey for me. And, and I, I appreciate this, this opportunity to, to speak to your audience. Well, well, thank you so much. And we're looking forward to, to speaking to you soon. And this has been a great opportunity. And we look forward to, to hearing your insights and following you. Thanks, Yehuda. It's been a pleasure. All the best. Feel good. Bye, everybody.